actual tw in the 28 pages, while there it, you have the information of the link between Zubaida's uh, phone book and numbers in the United States, in the 28 pages, it, it states on page 419, uh, the FBI noted that Apskol has an unlisted phone number. Now, this is a company that helped manage the uh, Bandar residents, if I understand it correctly. But then it says, a November 12, 2002 FBI response to the joint inquiry, which is the inquiry you chaired, states that, quote, CI traces have revealed no direct links between numbers found in Zubaida's phone book and numbers in the United States. Well, that's clearly not, not the case. Well, and that's, um, I, I'm sad to have to say this about a venerated uh, U.S. Uh, uh, institution like the FBI, but that was just one of instances in which the FBI said that they had not found anything in their investigation uh, and assumed that that was the end of it. Uh, another example, which is one of those things that we learned about after the 28 pages were written, uh, is that there were three of the hijackers, including Mohammed Atta, the leader of the 19, who did their flight training in Venice, Florida, a community near Sarasota, and that while they were taking their flight lessons, they uh, had connections with a prominent Saudi family, a three-generational family of grandfather who had been uh, close to the royal family, his daughter and son-in-law, and then uh, their grandchildren. Uh, the FBI stated uh, after uh, having uh, recognized that there was such a relationship that they found that there were no connections uh, between the 19, but between the three hijackers and this Saudi family. Subsequently, uh, in the files of the FBI, a report written by the FBI agent in charge of the investigation in Sarasota, he stated there were many connections between the hijackers and the family. Uh, again, uh, we're now, uh, through a Freedom of Information Act uh, request, uh, attempting to find out what were those many uh, connections and how far did the FBI investigation go in trying to establish what the significance of those connections right. were. Most of the information used in this audio will come from news articles and court documents in which I will provide some of them in the description. The Benevolence International Foundation, also known as the BIF, was a purported non-profit charitable trust-based in Saudi Arabia. It was determined to be a front for terrorist group Al-Qaeda and was banned by the United Nations Security Council Committee 1267 and the U.S. Department of the Treasury in November of 2022. The Islamic Benevolence Committee, also known as the BIC, was founded in 1987 by Adel bin Abdul Jalil Batterji of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and had operations in both Jeddah and Peshawar, Pakistan. The group was a charity that openly supported fighters against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, supplying weapons and funds to the Mujahideen and facilitating the immigration of foreign volunteer jihadists into the conflict zone. Another organization, the Benevolence International Corporation, is said to have been started in 1988 by Mohammed Jamil Khalifa, the brother-in-law of Osama bin Laden. At the time of founding and operation, it was known as an import-export company. It is said that this group was a front for the Abu Sayyaf Group, which is an Al-Qaeda affiliate organization located in East Asia province, the Philippines. In 1992, the Benevolence International Corporation, or BIC, in the Philippines folded public operations while the Islamic Benevolence Committee 
was renamed to the Benevolence International Foundation, or BIF. The new entity was incorporated as a tax exempt nonprofit in Illinois on March 30th, 1992, with Enam Aranu as its director. Aranu married an American woman and obtained citizenship in the United States. In 1993, the organization's headquarters moved to Chicago. Meanwhile, the Filipino BIC group would become a group set up to attack U.S. interests in the Philippines under Abu Sayyaf. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is said to have led the rest of the group. On June 15, 1994, U.S. Ambassador Melissa Wells visited the BIF headquarters on an envoy from President Bill Clinton and met with Mahmoud Mohammed Al Hassan Belou and praised BIF and its efforts to provide humanitarian relief. In late 1994, Mohammed Jamal Khalifa traveled to the United States to meet with Mohammed Lawai Bayazid, the president of BIC at the time. Khalifa and Bayazid were arrested in Mountain View, California in December of 1994. The FBI received communications from the Philippines that Khalifa was funding Operation Bajinka, a terrorist plot that foiled on January 6, 1995, in which 12 airliners were to be targeted by 1993 co-conspirator Ramzi Youssef and his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. However, Khalifa was deported to Jordan by the Immigration Naturalization Service in May of 1995. The Jordanian court acquitted Khalifa, and until his death, he lived in Saudi Arabia. Bayezid was also let go. During a sentencing hearing in August of 2003, U.S. District Judge Suzanne Colin told prosecutors that they failed to connect the dots and said there was no evidence that Enam Arunu identified with or supported terrorism. The U.S. government alleged that the BIC sent money and communications to bin Laden and purchased rockets, bayonets, dynamite, and other bombs for al-Qaeda in Chechnya, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, in which Mahmoud Salim, an al-Qaeda co-founder, and Enam Arunu were arrested. These allegations were withdrawn as a part of a February 2003 plea agreement in which Enam Arunu pleaded guilty to racketeering charges. The plea bargain allowed for him to provide information to prosecutors as long as charges that are related to al-Qaeda are dropped. He publicly denied any link to the group. In 2003, Attorney General John Ashcroft went before the media and announced the Enam huge Arno arrest operated the in which Enam Aranu was considered a terrorist operative that provided material witness statements against other people who are affiliated with al-Qaeda, but yet he himself denied any charge he was part of the group. Enam Arno operated the Benevolence International Foundation Incorporated as a scheme to use fraudulently the charitable contributions of Muslim Americans, U.S. corporations, and other donors to support violence overseas. With today's plea agreement, the government has secured the cooperation of Arno in the critical investigation into the funding of violence and violent acts overseas. The guilty plea also makes clear that we will prosecute and we will imprison those who would exploit the generosity of charitable donors to provide financing for violence overseas. Meanwhile, Bosnian authorities raided the Benevolence International Foundation. What they found was a document relating to Al-Qaeda. The documents were called Tariq Osama. This was used in the prosecution of the United States of America versus Ina Marinu in 2003, led by Northern District of Illinois U.S. Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald. 
in which under Section 2, evidence of the conspiracy, its participants, and statements in furtherance of the conspiracy, Section D, BIF's archive, in which it details two documents, Tariq Osama and Tariq al-Musadat. Regarding the file BIF archive, it is stated in the court document, quote, BIF had in its Sarajevo office a computer file labeled Tariq Osama or Osama's history. The file contains scanned images of documents which chronicles Osama bin Laden's activities in Afghanistan, which led to the formation of Al-Qaeda and even includes later reports of the danger bin Laden posed to the United States. BIF possessed in the file a handwritten draft list of the people referred to within Al-Qaeda as the Golden Chain, wealthy donors to Mujahideen efforts. Example 5 at the top of the list is a Quranic verse stating, and spend for God's cause. The list contains 20 names. And after each name is a parenthetical, likely indicating the person who received the money from the specified donor. Osama appears after seven of the listings, including the listing Bin Laden's brothers, Batterji, LBI, and BIF's founders, appears after six of the listings. Only three other persons are listed in the parentheses. Included in the same file as the Golden Chain, notes in an article from Arab News dated May 4th, 1988, titled, quote, Arab Youths Fight Shoulder to Shoulder with Mujahideen, end quote. In example six, a photograph within the article shows Bin Laden walking with defendant Enam Aranu, referred to in the caption as Abu Mahmoud from Syria. Another photograph within the article shows Ayman Kayat from Jeddah holding a rifle. Kayat was a high-ranking officer in LBI who later worked for the BIF. The article discusses a battle in the Masada area of the Jaj region and noted that defendant Aranu, referred to as Abu Mahmoud, a youth from the Syrian city of Hamat. The article quotes defendant Aranu, who said that Russians destroyed the trees the Mujahideen hoped to use as fortifications. BIF's Tariq Osama file contains a letter written to, quote, generous brother Abu al-Rida, end quote, from your brother Abu al-Kayaka, an alias of Osama bin Laden. Abu al-Rida is Muhammad Laoy Bayazid, who, as discussed above, was president of BIF in 1994. The letter states that although it is from bin Laden, it is signed by defendant Aranu using the name Abu Mahmoud. Defendant Aranu wrote, quote, bin Laden is far from me and he authorized me through a communication to sign on his behalf. My apology, end quote. The letter sends greetings to Bayezid from Al Masada, the camp where defendant Enam Aranu fought with bin Laden described in the Arab news article above. The letter instructs Bayezid to give the bearer of the letter, Omar Lufti, an airline ticket to Saudi Arabia. Another letter from bin Laden to Abu Rida explains that the time has come for an attack on the Russians. In example nine, bin Laden concludes the letter by asking Abu Rida to, quote, communicate my greeting to Abu al-Hassan al-Madani and I hope that he will visit us if he has returned from Hijaz. And I also hope that you bring 500,000 rupees at a minimum, end quote. As discussed above, Abu Hassan al-Madani, also known as Wael Julaidin, is a leader of a relief organization that provided logistical support to bin Laden called the Maktab al kirmat A letter on J. IRO letterhead recounting a meeting discussed attacks being launched from league offices and that passports should not be kept 
with the Saudi Red Crescent because Whale Juladeen was returning to Saudi Arabia. Working at the Saudi Red Crescent was Dr. Ayman al Fahari. BIF's Tariq Osama file also contains a March 4th, 1987 letter from bin Laden using his alias Abu al Kayaka to brother Abu al Rida, requesting that he give 500,000 rupees to the man bearing the letter. A March 17, 1987 letter to Bayezid requests that he assist two individuals in their travel to Yemen, including providing them with airline tickets and arrange their lodging. The author of the letter is Abu Mu'at al Masri, informed by Azid that this is based on what brother Abu Abdallah, also known as Osama bin Laden, informed us at the al Masada camp. The letter also requests that Bayezid send 400,000 rupees to quote the owner of the weapon for delivery in Parchinar, according to Abu al Hassan's wishes for security reasons, end quote. A letter from defendant Inam Aranu to Abu Hafsa Masri, also known as Muhammad Atef, a close associate of bin Laden, who later became Al Qaeda's military commander, is also in BIF's file. Example 14, the letter states that its bearer is from Hezab e Islami, Gulbuddin Hekmatar's faction, and loaned us a howitzer and it should be returned so it could be taken to Kabul. The letter also bears bin Laden's signature at the bottom. A letter from bin Laden to defendant Arunu instructs Arunu to consult with Abu Hafs al-Masri about locating a particular group of soldiers as camp guards. Example 15, another letter from an Abu Abdallah, also known as Osama bin Laden, to defendant Arunu informs Arunu that the author had been trying unsuccessfully to contact him on a certain radio. The author wrote that he hopes that Abu al Kayaka or bin Laden, has reached defendant Arunu safely. A separate letter from bin Laden to Abu Rida states that Abu Obeda and Abu Hafsa Masri should each be paid 4,500 rials monthly and treated like Mekteb al Kidamat, thus establishing that military commanders was salaried by the support organizations within the Maktab al -Kidimat. The foregoing documents possessed by BIF electronically corroborate that Defendant Aranu provided logistical support to Al-Qaeda fighters during the period in Afghanistan when he worked for LBI, part of the BIF enterprise. Later, CIA director George Tennant would basically state that information was not forthcoming. There wasn't enough information early to stop attacks such as 9-11. In a Senate Select Committee hearing dated 2004, Tennant had this to say. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the United States last week raised the terrorist threat level. We did so because of the threat reporting from multiple sources with strong al-Qaeda ties. The information we have points to plots aimed at targets on two fronts, in the United States and on the Arabian Peninsula. It points to plots timed to occur as early as the end of the Hajj, which occurs late this week. And it points to plots that could include the use of a radiological dispersion, dispersal device, as well as poisons and chemicals. The intelligence is not idle chatter on the part of terrorists or their associates. It is the most specific we have seen, and it is consistent with both our knowledge of Al-Qaeda's doctrine and our knowledge of plots in this network, and particularly its senior leadership has been working for years. The intelligence community is working directly. We see disturbing signs that Al-Qaeda has established a presence in both Iran and Iraq. In addition, we are concerned that Al-Qaeda continues to find refuge in the hinterlands of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is also developing or refining new means of attack, including the use of surface-to-air missiles, poisons, and air and surface and underwater methods to attack maritime targets. 
However, this information was not shared with anyone in the principal's meetings at the White House or with the FBI. CIA, throughout the mid-1990s, and especially in the summer of 2000 and 2001, would later claim that bin Laden posed absolutely no threat to the United States inside the country. So what has changed with the CIA? As for Ina Marinu and his links to Al-Qaeda, it seemed pretty clear. Not only did he have clear connections to the early formation of Al-Qaeda, he provided logistical support to a number of high-ranking Al-Qaeda officials, such as Osama bin Laden, Abu Obeda al-Banshiri, and Abu Hafs al-Masri. Meanwhile, information was hard to come by in the late 1980s, early 90s. Yet, the FBI will claim that nobody had ever given them information that would help to stop attacks like the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, the 1998 East Africa bombings, and of course, the 9-11 attacks. Even though that the latter is true, what was the problem with the FBI regarding all the money they were getting throughout the late 1990s with the creation of the bin Laden unit in 1999? Well, according to former FBI director, Louis Free, under the Clinton administration, it was a matter of not having enough material support. We had a very effective uh, program with respect to counterterrorism before September 11th, given the resources, in my view, and given the authorities that we had. Sometimes they worked. And the investigations were not investigations that dealt with individuals. Uh, when the FBI investigated uh, La Cosa Nostra, the FBI, as you know, before September 11, had three and a half percent of the federal government's anti-terrorism budget. And it's no, uh, it's, it's no news to anybody that for many, many years, as your executive director recounted, uh, the resource issue and the legal authority issue certainly limited what we were able to do before September 11. So who deserves the blame for the intelligence failures of September 11, 2001, when all of the evidence provided in this video, as well as other evidences that I've mentioned in previous videos regarding Al-Qaeda and their terrorist affiliates worldwide, it wasn't a lack of information. It was the intelligence community possessing an abundance of it. So why didn't the NSA or the CIA basically share this information, not just with the FBI, but also with the State Department? Why were they hoarding the information? And why was nobody held accountable for it? 